So my lecture tonight, who invented extinction? And where I want to start tonight is with this guy. Anybody tell me who we're looking at? The giant sloth? I went to a museum unknowing he was there. Uh-huh. Turned the corner and screamed. <laughs> so this is Rusty, the giant sloth. Sadly, he does not get dressed up anymore. It used to be the case that you could go and see his outfits changing from week to week as different holidays were being celebrated, different activities were going on around campus. Um, but they found out that that was causing a bit too much damage to the exhibit, so they had to lay off uh, dressing Rusty the Giant Sloth up. Um, but I want to start here, one, because it's a local celebrity, right? You can go down to the Museum of Natural History and, and check Rusty out. But I also want to start out here because he, in some ways, is a great entry point into this question of who invented extinction. Um, so Rusty is what is known as a paleolithic charismatic megafauna. Paleolithic charismatic megafauna. So charismatic megafauna are really big animals, right? An elephant is a charismatic megafauna. Uh, lions are kind of borderline, but rhinoceros is definitely, right? And one of the things I'm going to be talking about tonight is how it used to be the case that North America and South America and the world more generally were populated by all kinds of versions of Rusty, right? So mastodons, mammoths, woolly mammoths, uh, various versions of elephants. There used to be camels, giant sloths, all kinds of different creatures, right? Saber-toothed tigers, these things that existed in the ancient world, in the Paleolithic world, and no longer exist today. Um, and the story really begins in many ways right around the turn of the 19th century, so about 1800 or so, when uh, paleontologists and geologists are beginning to study and understand the fossil remains that they're uncovering. So Rusty here, in all of his hairy, orange, orangutan-colored glory, represents fossil discoveries, right? And the ability to analyze those fossils and compare them with living creatures and the bones of living creatures to understand a very basic fact that this creature doesn't exist anymore. So we're going to be talking about how that story comes about, how we come to understand what extinction is and what it means going back through history. So a question for you all. I say extinction. What are some of the things that come to mind for you? Yeah. Exterminated. Exterminated. The mass extinction. Mass extinction. So we're going to be talking about mass extinctions today. Yeah. What are some things that come to mind for you? In the Irish shirt, in the front. Um, 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 like the asteroid that destroyed the dinosaurs. The asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. We're going to get to that today as well. Yeah. Outdated for the environment. Say that again. Outdated for the environment. Outdated for the environment. So concepts potentially of fitness and how well an animal is fit to its environment or a species is fit to its environment. We'll talk a bit about that today as well. Other thoughts? How about you? Extinction. Yeah. Dinosaurs, yeah, so again, asteroids, dinosaurs, things that have gone extinct in our past. So these are all some of the topics we're going to be delving into today and thinking about today as we go forward. So some of these big questions that I want to talk about today. One is this question of who invented extinction, right? And I think one of the sort of spoiler alert kinds of things, one of the things we're going to see is that it's not any one person, that it's a process over time, and that our understanding of extinction is also evolving over time, that it's coming to mean different things in different time periods. We're going to think a bit about why in some ways it's actually been hard to invent. I think one of the themes that we'll see as we look at histories of extinction over the past 300 years is that people are really resistant to the idea. Um, especially or even scientists, that there's a lot of debate about extinction. There's a lot of resistance to believing that it could be an explanation for what people are seeing in fossil evidence. So we'll look at some of those forms and resistance and try and understand them a bit tonight. And then finally, we're going to think a bit about, well, what does our attitude towards extinction or our understanding of extinction, what does it tell us about ourselves? What can it suggest for us about our ideas about God, about religion, about humanity's place in nature, about morality, um, about social order, about concepts of progress? So we'll try and link in sort of some of those bigger ideas from the social and historical context and kind of place the science in its social and historical context. So those are the three, three kind of big questions I want to think about today. Who invented extinction? Why has it been so hard to invent? And what does our understanding of extinction tell us about ourselves? So just a couple of terms quickly that are going to come up through the presentation so that when you see them, you'll sort of be able to understand what we're talking about. Um, one of these is natural theology. 
Um, so natural theology is an idea that sort of comes from the 17th and the 18th century, but is really persistently influential through the 19th. It's the idea that scientists, who are often called natural philosophers in this 17th and 18th century period, the idea that in studying nature they can uncover a kind of divine plan, that they can understand sort of what God intended for the world through the study of nature. The idea that basically every species, every organism, everything you see is created and has a purpose, and the creator is God, and the purpose is divine, right? So science and religion in the early period that we're going to be talking about are very deeply connected with each other. And one of those themes we're going to be tracing is that part of understanding or inventing extinction means to a certain extent abandoning this idea on the part of the scientists. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Next thing, stratigraphy. Do I have any geology majors in the room or maybe somebody who's taken a geology class? Yeah, what's stratigraphy? I just took geology. <laughs> I just took it. So stratigraphy is the science or a key component of geology, right? As it develops in the 18th and 19th century, understanding that the Earth's soils, the Earth's strata, the Earth's rocks accrete in layers and that you can read those layers almost like a timeline. So this begins to develop in the 18th century, right, where people, biologists, um, particularly in the area around Paris and in France and in Germany, they start to sort of go to cliff faces and to rock outcroppings and to start to try and read those layers and set them in a timeline. So it's stratigraphy is the tool that we use to date, for example, fossils. So if you find a fossil in a rock outcropping, figuring out which layer of soil it's in is really important for dating it. So we'll talk a little bit about stratigraphy today. Um, finally, somebody mentioned the dinosaurs. We've got mass extinctions going on. We've got asteroids. Um, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is the point where the asteroid hit the Earth, the point in time. And it defines the difference between the Cretaceous period, which is sort of T-Rex is still walking around, and the tertiary period, which T-Rex is not walking around anymore. And tertiary sort of refers more to our period. So the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is a line in the soils. It's a, a line in that stratigraphy that sort of marks that kind of boundary point. We're going to come back to this as well when we start to think about mass extinctions, and especially the meaning of extinction in the 20th century, which is where we got that idea or when that idea emerged of that asteroid crashing into the earth and killing all the dinosaurs. Finally, charismatic megafauna. We've already talked, up, talked a little bit about. That one's gonna be coming up again today. And then finally, I just wanted to sort of highlight that sort of the historical domain for what I'm talking about today. Um, there are lots of other ideas about extinction, about evolution that are sort of outside the history of Anglo-American and European science, but that's the main focus that we'll be thinking about today. It comes to kind of encompass a global focus through the empires and through sort of European colonialism in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. So we'll encompass the world sort of through looking at the ways in which biology, geology, the sciences of extinction, evolution, form and relationship to European colonialism. Um, but for the most part, the perspective is going to be from that Anglo-American and European world. Um, though I would love to sort of talk about questions about what evolution and extinction might look like from outside that perspective, if you have questions about that. OK, so I want to interest, introduce us through some of the major kind of concepts in this long durée history. We're going to start out by thinking about the 17th and the 18th century, and we're going to work our way through the 19th and the 20th century, thinking about different resonances and different understandings of uh, extinction, sort of the termination of species through that period. So if we go back a bit in time, we can have a sort of a version of this or a sort of understanding of how species are related to each other um, in the 18th century. So this idea of natural theology that I talked about, right? There's a sort of basic assumption within the Western world, within Europe um, and within England, that all sort of species, all creatures are created by God. Everything has a purpose. Um, and this goes back to a kind of biblical narrative. So individuals, natural philosophers, common people, sort of use the Bible as a kind of history book, essentially, and sort of read the creation narrative as one that's basically literally true. Nothing new is made, and nothing goes extinct. So everything that was created was created right at the very beginning, um, in those first six days of creation, and nothing can go extinct, or nothing has gone extinct. That world is hierarchically graded and ordered so that there's a, a chain of being, that's what that idea of the great chain of being refers to, that goes from sort of the lowest snail, the smallest little animalcule is what they called them when they looked through their microscopes. They didn't necessarily have the word for bacteria. 
cream yet, but the tiny little animalcules that you could see flitting around under a microscope are in a hierarchical chain of being that works its way all the way up through humans, um, into angels, into sort of higher beings, and up to God, right? So there's a kind of graded natural and social hierarchy, and they're all in that great chain of being. Um, part of what this means, and this is a theme we'll come back around to again, often there's something interesting here about the relationship between nature and society. Um, the, the, the hierarchy here, the human order, is natural, right? Is sort of what this great chain of being idea is saying. So to the extent that there's hierarchy, hierarchy within human worlds as well as natural worlds, it's natural and it's ordained by God. So something to kind of keep in mind when thinking about the contexts of these ideas. Now, as I mentioned before as well, the history of the cosmos is relatively short. So for 17th century, 18th century, beginning of the 18th century, what was basically believed was that you had about 6,000 years to play with. So human history, written history, kind of maps on to natural history. Um, in the late 17th century, um, there was an Anglican archbishop by the name of Usher, so Bishop Usher. He calculated it down to exactly 4004 B 4, BC was the year of creation. He even pinned it down to a specific month and a specific day of the week. So it was like a Tuesday afternoon at 5 o'clock or something like that. God decided to, uh, to get started on creation. So there's this way in which there isn't a natural past outside of that human history, right? Um, that's pretty commonly accepted through the 17th and into the 18th century. And part of the story that we're, we're telling today is how those pasts diverge. So how do we end up with the idea that the human past is only one little part of the broader history of the cosmos and the history of the Earth? Again, humans are near the top of the hierarchy. So humans have this sort of position at the top, close to God. Um, within human societies, those are further graded and further in a hierarchy as well. So that, say, a king is closer to God than, say, an ordinary commoner would be. Tied in with this idea of the humans being near the top of the hierarchy, and again, this is an idea that we're going to see in some of the sources we take a look at in a few minutes, there's also an idea that everything, is in, everything on Earth or everything in nature is there for human use. Right? Um, so not only does every species have a purpose, but quite often that purpose is to be consumed, to be used in some way by human beings. You see this idea expressed in the 17th century, 18th century, um, through some of the colonial voyages that Europeans send out to the Americas, to Africa, to India. Um, oftentimes they're searching for, say, new natural resources. They're searching for medicines that could be used to cure diseases. They see the world in some way as sort of giant at least from the perspective of the history of medicine, a kind of giant, giant sort of apothecary shop or a uh, giant drugstore, basically, where they can go out and search and find things that will be useful to humans. This, this attitude, I think, is going to condition and inform a lot of what we're looking at and a lot of how they can come to see extinction. Um, and the ways in which earlier natural philosophers and others see extinction almost as justified, right? So even when they come to notice that extinction is actually a thing, right? When they stop believing that nothing goes extinct, they still see it as natural. They see it as part of a natural order, something that can be sort of justified by this idea that humans are at the top of the hierarchy and nature is made for their use and their purpose. Now, and this is sort of where I, wanna, I want us to sort of, again, fo focus on this, this idea that Extinction is difficult to see, and we'll look at some examples of this. Natural philosophers, again, the 17th century is a fancy term for scientists. Natural philosophers continue to believe that extinction isn't possible, that nothing goes extinct, despite growing evidence that extinction is a thing, that it is happening, and that human activity contributes to it. So we'll look at some examples of that in just a second. So this is the dodo. This is a bird that was driven to extinction by European colonialism in the 17th century. Um, and we see natural historians in this period who are beginning to observe the dodo and acknowledge that it appears to be disappearing from the islands in the East African Ocean where it has lived at that time period. This is an image from the 19th century. Um, and yet are unable to acknowledge this is extinction. Um, even to the point where one of the naturalists who we, we can think about as being involved in these efforts, a guy named Hans Sloan, um, who assembles a massive collection of animals, species, plants, objects, minerals from around the world. He actually has a painting of a dodo in his collection. And so in some sense, he kind of realizes that humans are involved, but nonetheless adheres so strongly to this idea that 
nature is ordered, it's created by God, that nothing can go extinct, that it's not something he's really willing to acknowledge. Okay. So another aspect of that, um, this idea of natural theology, this idea of purpose in creation. Um, this is a quote from William Paley, who wrote The Natural Theology in 1802. Um, this was a book that Darwin read and left a big impression on him. Um, and what Paley has to say is, but suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer which I had before given, that for anything I knew, the watch might have always been there. Yet why should not this answer serve for the watch as well as for the stone? Why is it not as admissible in the second case as in the first? For this reason and no other, namely that when we come to inspect the watch, we perceive what we could not discover in the stone, that its several parts are framed and put together for a purpose, that they are so formed and adjusted to produce motion, and that motion so regulated to point out the hour of the day, that if the different parts had been differently shaped from what they are, or placed after any other manner or in any other order than that in which they are placed, Either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine, or none which could have answered the use that is now served by it. There cannot be design without a designer, right? It's sort of what Paley concludes from this example that he lays before the reader. So he's comparing nature in some way to a machine, right? A clock, a watch, imagining the natural philosopher, imagining the individual as somebody who comes upon that watch, stumbles upon it in nature, right? That they would conclude that it had to be fitted exactly for that purpose because without that, it would be unable to function. So this idea of sort of creation as purpose-driven, purpose-built, having an end in mind is something, this idea as expressed by William Paley is something that has huge influence through the 17th and 18th century, kind of is formulated by Paley in a very clear way in 1802, um, and continues to influence 19th century biology as well. Okay, so let's go back to this problem of fossils. So we talked a little bit about Rusty, uh, the ground sloth, at the very beginning of the lecture. There's a huge problem with fossils, and fossils are the key to understanding extinction. Um, in the 17th century is when they first begin to be discussed. So in the context of this idea of there being a kind of great chain of being, the 17th century is completely baffled by fossils. They do not know what to do. So some people say, well, I don't know, maybe nature's playing tricks on us, right? They sort of dig these things up. It's like, it looks like a snail. It looks like a horn. It's a rock I've never seen before. I don't understand this. Why is there a clamshell at the top of a mountain? It makes no sense. Um, so they think maybe nature's ch ch tricking us, right? They're jokes of nature is the phrase that's used. This is a really common interpretation in the 17th century. Um, but people are beginning to say, well, could they be the remains of once living creatures? Could they be evidence that things have gone extinct? We don't know. We have to think about that. They have this question, right? Particularly, why are there fossils of marine creatures on mountaintops in, in the Swiss Alps? And you'll see evidence of uh, different kinds of mussels, of clams, of the kinds of creatures that have small, hard bodies and tend to fossilize well. Why do you see them there? Could they be seeds growing in the earth, right? Could they be maybe sort of there are living creatures that somehow in the shape of frogs or mussel shells or clams that somehow grow in the earth, right? Could they be sort of in that way, formed in that way? Could they be creatures deposited by Noah's flood? So this was a very common explanation for why are there fossils of marine creatures on mountaintops? Could it be Noah, right? Could this be part of human history, right, is the big question that they all ask. Now, as we get into the late 17th century and into the early 18th century, they're trying to come with consensus around this. They're kind of struggling towards the idea of extinction, but having a really hard time with it. And they're really sort of looking for natural explanations for Noah's flood, that a lot of what they're doing is trying to map the evidence of nature, which doesn't fit all that well onto the biblical timeline, onto the biblical timeline. So in the 17th century, they're sort of stuck in this idea that, you know, the Earth's history is very short, and we, what our job is is to try and figure out how nature maps onto the Bible, and they're really struggling with that. The other thing I would point out here, and this is going to be something that we'll see in later centuries as well, is that often science follows economic activity. Um, so oftentimes, as natural philosophers, as naturalists are beginning to discover these fossils, it's through doing things like going into coal mines, for example. So as um, artisans, as sort of industry is digging deeper into the earth in the 17th century as a way of bringing up resources, natural philosophers are going under the ground, checking out and seeing what is mined there and identifying fossils in those spaces. So that's another kind of common theme in the history of extinction that, that science and economic activity, science and the generation of energy are very closely related. <clears throat> 
Okay, just some examples of what those 17th century collections would have looked like. These are cases from Hans Sloane's collection, which you can still go take a look at in London. Um, this is a case that shows some of his um, me medical materials. So that idea of the world kind of being uh, Europe's drugstore in a sense, um, this represents that idea very much where he's got these items that are taken from around from the kinds of collecting voyages that you know, friends, merchants, um, other natural philosophers went on and brought back to him as potential cures for diseases. Similarly, plant materials that could have been used in similar ways. So when you think about these collections of the 17th century, you can have these images in mind. This idea of seeds. So Edward Lloyd is a natural philosopher from the late 17th century. He's really into this idea that perhaps, perhaps there's seeds in the earth, right? Fossils that grow in the earth are seeds that are, that are born there. They're not coming from Noah's flood. They're not extinct creatures. They just have this ability to flourish. Very hard for evidence of this. And so he would go to building sites, places where, um, where new ground was being broken, where new, new ground was being excavated, new fences were being built, buildings were being built, that kind of thing, um, and would talk with workmen. So again, this idea that scientific activity follows economic activity, where the ground has been disturbed is often where paleontologists, where geologists will get good work done. Um, and he found in this particular example, some workmen who told them that they had found mussels living sort of miles from the sea underground beneath this building. Um, he was unable to see the evidence of it himself, is what he says here, that by the time he got to the place where these mussel shells had been discovered, they could discover no such thing, so that all I could do was only to get the three workmen present to attest to the relation of subscribing their marks. So he asks them to tell him the story and confirm that it's true. Um, and again, what I think is really interesting about this is, again, the resistance to the idea of extinction, right? The resistance to the idea that fossils could represent something that may have once been in the sea and was now buried in the earth. So he would rather trust this story that he's being told by these workmen rather than alter his ideas about what fossils might be. Um, again, right, he says at the bottom, sort of if they attest to this relation, they subscribe their marks, they sort of write an X below it, assuming these guys aren't literate. This being allowed, I know not my hypothesis may stand as fair as any other, right? This idea that fossils grow from seeds in the earth. So again, a good example of that resistance. The resistance to, ex to extinction. Again, John Ray is a natural philosopher from the late 17th century, early 18th century, um, and he confronted very closely the evidence for Noah's flood being the cause of the sort of fossils that are being seen on the mountaintops, the marine fossils being seen on the mountaintops, and he too struggled with this idea of extinction. So John Ray wrote, it will hence follow that many species of animals have been lost out of the world, which philosophers and divines, clerics, are unwilling to admit, esteeming the destruction of any one species, a dismembering of the universe. So the destruction of one means a dismembering or damage to the universe as a whole and rendering the world imperfect. Whereas they think that divine providence is especially concerned and solicitous to secure and preserve the works of creation. So, What's John Ray's sort of answer to this problem? Um, what he says is that, well, oh, so they still live someplace else, right? He's kind of trying to get around this, right? So he says, for example, at the bottom, so wolves and beavers, which we are well assured were sometimes native of England, have been here utterly destroyed and extirpated out of this island. So he's English, and he's saying, we don't have any wolves and beavers anymore. Yet there's still plenty of them elsewhere, right? So maybe if we destroy the dodo in Mauritius, maybe it'll still exist somewhere else, right? Um, this idea that, well, okay, still the world left to discover. So he's still trying to save this idea that nothing gets destroyed. Um, and it's an example of that resistance that naturalists have to understanding it in this way. Okay, so 18th century, massive expansion of the timeline is the kind of next step. So the 17th century figures out fossils, wow, big deal, really confusing what's going on here. The 18th century has to expand and separate out the um, human history from natural history. And so we see naturalists, uh, Georges Buffon is one of them, James Hutton is another. They begin to look for ways to expand the timeline of the Earth's history, to expand it beyond just the timeline. So they're doing scientific studies where they're trying to date the age of the Earth. Um, some of the first suggestions are 75,000 years. James Hutton extends it out to millions by the end of the 18th century. Um, from our own perspective of the age of the Earth, you know, this seems like a very, very paltry sum, but was very challenging at the time. Um, Buffon, for example, had to retract some of his initial estimates because he was sort of challenged and criticized for that reason, that it was too sort of 
too much of an affront to biblical history and the sort of centrality of the Bible um, in our understanding of human history. We get extinction by the end of the century. So in terms of comparative anatomy, Georges Cuvier is very important. Um, he's a French natural historian who works at the Museum um, for, the Nat for, for Natural History in Paris um, and is able to assemble a massive assemblage of fossil skeletons in his museum and is able to compare them. Um, so if we go back to Rusty the Giant Sloth, for example, um, he had examples of that fossil in his museum and was able to compare them with living animals. So I think you all read an essay by Ed Young about natural history museums and their role in kind of contributing to the study of evolution and extinction. This is a great example about how European natural history functioned, that it was through bringing together examples from all over the world, being able to study them comparatively, that extinction could emerge as a concept, right? So for Cuvier, he's only able to sort of bring out the idea that the American master and I'll show you a picture of that in a second, has gone extinct by being able to compare sample bones from Siberia, from America, from African elephants, from Indian elephants. So in carefully studying the teeth of those mammals, the structure of their bones, he's able to say definitively that in fact, no, the American mastodon, uh, which is an elephant-like creature, is not in fact a modern elephant, right? So able to establish definitively this idea of extinction right around the turn of the 19th century. Now again, that resistance. Cuvier is willing to grant extinction, but not willing to grant any idea of evolution. And so what he believes basically is that uh, there's maybe sort of things go extinct, but then there's a special creation, what's called a special creation that replaces them. So he too is resistant to this idea of extinction. And then finally, in terms of the kind of key components that are going into developing or changing these ideas of extinction in the early 19th century, um, Charles Lyell is a British geologist, and he brings in this idea, again, that there's a very, very long timeline. He expands that timeline indefinitely long, saying that the history of nature, the history of the world is indefinitely long, um, and also introduces an idea of uniformitarianism. So uniformitarianism and catastrophism are kind of the two poles for thinking about how geological time and extinction work. Uniformitarianism says that the only changes that we see operate, or the way we can explain geological change and change over time is only through things that we can see operating on human time scales, right? So Charles Lyell, for example, would say that sort of mountains gradually sort of uplift through sands and silts kind of operating, right? They sort of gradually build up or are gradually eroded through the actions of oceans, the actions of water, the actions of wind. That's a more uniformitarian perspective. And it was Charles Lyell's way of arguing for a very long history of the Earth. Um, a catastrophic perspective is one that's informed a little bit by that Noah's flood narrative still, the idea that radical change can happen. Right? That's the more mass extinction, uh, dinosaurs, uh, asteroid kind of perspective, right? These are kind of two poles that we'll see repeated in the history of extinction. Those who believe that more gradual change, those who believe in a more radical, abrupt changes. And Lyell is responsible for bringing in that uniformitarian perspective. The Mastodon, um, published by Cuvier in 1821. Again, assembled from the bones that were discovered in fossil sites in North America. Okay, so 17th century says fossils, what the heck are those? We gotta figure this out. The 18th century says, okay, we're starting to get these fossils figured out. We have this idea of extinction. Um, the 19th century says, okay, fine, extinction, yes, we agree. Um, and extinction is deeply related to evolution, but it's not our fault, right? So there's this question of the human role in extinction that we wanna think about. Um, Charles Darwin is really key to understanding this history. Um, as a young man in the 1830s, he grabs a copy of Lyell's Principles of Geology, takes it with him on a voyage around the world, and through comparing and kind of seeing species, mastodons, fossils, strata, layers of the earth from many, many different places, right? Again, that idea of kind of collecting things up so you can see it all together, is able to assemble his theory of evolution. And he sees evolution and extinction as kind of two poles. They're sort of twin parts of the theory that they go together really strongly. He publishes The Origin of Species in 1859, a book called Descent of Man in 1871. In both of these he talks a bit about extinction and we'll talk a bit about what that looks like. Um, basically again he sees them as two things that are deeply related to each other. That you can't have evolution without extinction. 
that they're kind of components of the theory together. Um, and one of the ways he describes this in The Origin of Species, which is published in 1859, is that the number of places in the polity of nature is not indefinitely great. Um, remember back in sort of the 17th century when we had the great chain of being, there are these metaphors that crossed over between human hierarchy and natural hierarchy. Again, note that crossing over, right? So polity of nature implies a kind of social structure to nature, right, in that metaphor. So again, there's sort of an echo or an idea there that natural and human society, history of nature, history of humans, echo each other or reinforce each other in some way. Now, he's a little bit hard to read in some ways on the causes of extinction in both the origin of species and the descent of man. Um, on the one hand, the way he talks about extinction in the origin of species, he presents it as something of a mystery. Um, and what he has to say about it is that there are so many factors, so many possible causes for the extinction of any one organism that it's really difficult for us to say exactly what could have caused that extinction. Um, but he also says maybe we shouldn't be surprised by extinction, right? So just as an individual can die, so too can a species die. So he presents it almost as a kind of everyday mystery. And again, this is almost, you feel a little frustrated reading Darwin because he acknowledges or sort of sees examples where humans have a hand in extinction. So say for example, when um, plant species are carried on the hull of a ship from one location to another, they show up say at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, they have this ability to outcompete or destroy other, ant other plant species that are n the natively there. He sort of talks about examples like that but doesn't see a human hand in them, that he sort of removes the human hand from those examples. Um, on the other hand, and again, with this sort of connection with colonialism, with this sort of European colonialism of the 19th century, he does connect colonialism with the, what he calls the extinction. Very observant about describing, and this is in The Descent of Man, based by um, peoples in the 19th century. So um, Aboriginal Australians, for example, um, individuals who live in Tasmania, um, Aboriginals in places like uh, the Sandwich Islands, Tahiti, um, the Cook Islands, so the South Pacific, right? He's sort of halfway in between being able to acknowledge that there might be a human role in extinction um, and sort of beginning to sort of see that human role in extinction, particularly when applied to human societies. So this is Darwin writing in The Origin of Species. Um, and this is from the very last kind of uh, paragraph of the book um, where he talks about sort of his overall view of nature. And I want to highlight a couple of phrases here um, and also highlight again the absence of extinction from this view. So it's, what Darwin writes is, it's interesting to contemplate an entangled ba bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. These laws, taken in the largest sense, being growth with reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, variability, a ratio of increase, then he goes on to say that there's a grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And while the planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms have been and are being evolved. Now, what I think is really interesting about this statement, again, thinking about the resistance that natural philosophers, scientists have shown to this idea of extinction, is that he's presenting this vision of his theory where everything's great, right? There's competition, there's increase, but it's a beautiful, elaborate, rich ecosystem that he's presenting to us, and one in which extinction doesn't seem to play a role. So he's a little bit sort of wary of acknowledging, again, that aspect of destruction that his theory requires in some sense, and wants to present to us a view of it that sort of shows the richness that evolution provides, the kind of, almost going back to that idea of natural theology, there's no God here, but evolution itself sort of plays that role of creating design and creating purpose, right? And so from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Um, this is the contrasting picture, right? So from the other side, where Darwin starts to think about the role of colonialism 
um, the role of European empires um, and the sort of the issues that they are causing, the sort of colonial destruction of, of, of uh, places in the indigenous peoples and especially Australia and Tasmania and New Zealand. Um, and again here, the language is very neutral, but it also, you get a little frustrated with him because he seems to see the perspective from the other side, even if he's not quite willing to acknowledge it. And so what he writes is, although the gradual decrease and ultimate extinction of the races of man is a highly complex problem, so again, he presents sort of humans as just another part of nature here, depending on many causes which differ in different places and at different times, it is the same problem as that presented by the extinction of one of the higher animals. So remember earlier how I said in the 17th century, with the natural and the human hierarchy were sort of part of the same graded thing, right? Human hierarchies are natural. Um, the natural hierarchy and human, natural, human hierarchies are entwined with each other. Again, that's something that's consistent with Darwin, right? So that the extinction of an animal and the extinction of humans, he's putting in the same kind of parallel world and examining them both as natural problems. Um, and he writes that the New Zealander, so he's thinking here of Maori peoples, the New Zealander seems conscious of this parallelism for he compares his future fate with that of the native rat now almost exterminated by the European rat. Um, now obviously that's a distasteful comparison for us um, because of the way it's sort of putting people and, um, and rats in the same place. But what I would suggest is that it does say that for a second he's imagining that the Europeans are complicit, right? Or the Europeans are causing these extinctions in some sense. And so even though He's very unwilling to acknowledge the human hand in extinction in some of his other writings. He's at least reaching toward that idea here in this passage about colonialism. <coughs> now thinking about the spaces in which this research is carried out. Um, we read that article by Ed Yong that talked a little bit about um, how museums function as sort of arcs of biodiversity, places where information is collected, are collected. Um, we have here a picture of a museum that was built right about sort of contemporary with Darwin. It's the Museum of Natural History in London. What are some of the things you notice about this building? Looks like a cathedral. Looks like a cathedral? Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. It's big. It's big. Yeah. And the glasses and the blue sweater. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a cathedral, it's big, right? Again, highlighting those continuities. So even though we have these massive transformations going on between the 17th century and the 19th century, right? These massive transformations where we go from a biblical timeline to one that's more sort of grounded in a very deep natural history that precedes the human. <coughs> we have this idea of there being a kind of temple to nature, right? that the architecture of the Museum of Natural History and other museums like it, you could I don't know, maybe go to the Field Museum in Chicago, it's got more of a Greek and Roman temple aesthetic to it, but again that idea of the temple, that these become the sort of new holy sites, sort of the sites of pilgrimage, right? Um, that sort of being a tourist and going to one of these places is a little bit like how what going to a cathedral might have been in a previous era. And what I would suggest is that these kinds of sites, right, these are the places where this work gets done. They're sites of collection. So if we think about science in its social context, we think about science um, being related to the economic and political activity that's going on around it. Darwin would have been unable, Cuvier would have been unable to construct their histories of evolution, their histories of extinction without these sites and without all of the travelers and all of the informants that are involved in bringing information to these places. So a museum of natural history functions as a kind of collection point, right? That sort of travelers from around the world go out, collect fossils, collect specimens, um, you know, they're sort of killing birds and preserving the dried specimens, the feathers, that kind of thing. And they bring them back to this place and the sort of official, the natural philosopher, the one in the center can go through and sort them, right? There's this process through which in the creation of empires in the 18th and 19th century, a global view of nature. And that global view of nature that they develop sort of is dependent upon the networks of empire. Because how do you think specimens get back to a museum like this? It's through the ships of the Navy that go out, right? Darwin himself, when he travels um, as a young man, he's traveling on a British Navy ship, right? It's through the trade, through merchants that go out. So through these official channels that as empires are created, so too is this ability to see the world in a new way.
Um, so when we think about histories of evolution, histories of extinction, we have to think of them as intimately connected to the formation of empires in this period. We can also think of them as intimately connected to the home. So this is another space. So again, when you imagine the spaces of natural history, the spaces in which evolution is sort of figured out, extinction is figured out. This is Darwin's study. So in his home um, in Down House in southern England, about 20 or 30 miles south of London. He didn't have a university position. He worked at home. Um, and this is the office where he did it. And it's an office that, much like that Natural History Museum, serves as a kind of center for pulling in all the information about biodiversity from around the world and processing it and writing about it. So Darwin here at his desk, um, and he, I don't know if you can see it here, but he basically invented this special wheelie chair um, very early in the office, office engineering architecture. He had wheels put on his chair so he could zoom around his office a bit. He would write letters. So we had correspondents in Australia, in New Zealand, in the Americas, who were always sending him pieces of information, statistics, stories that he could use for the formation of his own ideas. Um, his books are off to the side back here. The table here and here are some of the results of his own scientific experiments. So in addition to collecting information from around the world, much like the Natural History Museum did, he's also performing his own studies of anatomy, um, his own studies of corals, for example, which he studied um, very, very closely in the 1840s as a prelude to writing The Origin of Species. So again, when we think about the spaces that allow for understanding, beginning to invent these ideas, we have to think both about the museum and about the home as spaces where that's happening. Um, and some of his children, actually, you can find their notes and sketches and drawings on the backs of his notes about evolution and his scholarly papers. So he's very much embedded in that home life. So I mentioned before, again, right, we talked about the dodo a bit before. Um, I want to again go back to this idea of resistance, right? That again, even as we begin to understand what extinction is, there's a resistance to seeing a human hand in it. And even when we see the human hand in extinction, there's still a resistance to seeing that human hand as bad, right? So this idea that extinction has a purpose, or not that extinction has a purpose, but that humans that nature is given for humans, right? That nature is created and given for humans is one that has a lot of persistence. And I think it could even help us to understand attitudes towards extinction and how they vary even into the present day. So this is from a quote from a book from the middle part of the 19th century about the dodo and about its history. Um, and I'm gonna read this one out again just because I think it's important for understanding some of the concepts that we're thinking about. Um, so what the author wrote was these singular birds, this dodo that went extinct, it was overhunted on the islands in the East African Ocean. The dodo furnishes the first clearly attested instances of the extinction of organic species through human agency. It has been proved, however, that other examples of the kind have occurred both before and since, and many species of animals and of plants are now undergoing this inevitable process of destruction before the ever advancing tide of human population. Again, notice the language that's used there, this ever advancing tide of human population as if it's just a natural thing, right? Nobody has control over it, so who could stop extinction because we can't control this ever advancing tide, it's like an ocean, right? We cannot see without regret, so the author is sad, that the uh, extinction is happening, the extinction of the last individual of any race of organic beings whose progenitors colonized the pre-Adamite earth. Pre-Adamite there just means before the Adam of Genesis. But our consolation must be found in the reflection that man is destined by his creator to, quote, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. The progress of man and civilization, no less than his numerical increase, continually extends the geographical domain of art, and they mean kind of technology, by trenching on the territories of nature. And hence the zoologist or botanist of future ages will have a much narrower field for his researches than that which we enjoy at present. It is therefore the duty of the naturalist to preserve to the stores of science the knowledge of these extinct or expiring organisms when he is unable to preserve their lives, so that our acquaintance with the marvels of animal and vegetable existence may offer no detriment by the losses which the organic creation seems destined to sustain. So what are some of the things you notice in that passage? There's a lack of an understanding of an ecosystem. Lack of an understanding of an ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. Maybe some phrases that jump out at you. It's like a resignation that nothing can be done. Nothing can be done, yeah. How about you? What do you think? Phrases that jump out at you. No? Yeah. 
in the Wisconsin sweatshirt. Expiring organisms. Expiring organisms. Why does that one jump out at you, do you think? Because it kind of implies that they were going extinct anyway. They're going extinct anyway. Yeah, so again, maybe we're recognizing human agency, but maybe the human agency isn't really there at all. Yeah. Other thoughts behind you? We are somebody. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. How come? Um, it kind of tugs at the idea of like things like manifest destiny and things like that, that it's like, oh well, it's like it was, it's supposed to happen anyway. It's beyond our control, right? It's kind of what it seems to be implying. So I think that what's really interesting about this passage, and again, really interesting about the way attitudes, extinction, are or are not changing is again right so we've got this idea that okay extinction is a thing we understand that humans have a role to play in it that they are in fact right that ever advancing tide of human population but nonetheless we find a kind of justification for that right that this is a kind of common theme in the history of how we understand extinction and again thinking of those continuities between sort of the earlier period, the 17th century and the 19th century, there's a return to that biblical phrase, right? A return to the Bible as a way of justifying this. So man is destined by his creator to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So they're quoting an English translation of the book of Genesis. Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting about this quote, and again, kind of going back to the question of museums, of natural history museums, of zoos as well, something that you can think about in relation to the modern era. Um, we've talked about the zoo, we've talked about the natural history museum as this kind of space in an empire where all of the animals are brought back, all of the species, and they can be compared and contrasted, and you can sort of see the idea of extinction. Now here we're talking about them as an archive or as a library, right? So. He's saying that it's the job of the naturalist, the job of the natural philosopher, when he's unable to preserve the lives of extinct species, to maintain them so that later, later generations can marvel at them, right? To a certain extent, zoos function a little bit like this in the present day, that we have um, you know, a, lot of, a number of extinct or near extinct species who may be going extinct in the wild, but zoos start captive breeding programs as a way of maintaining populations of at least within that sort of one space. And I wanted to go back to your comment about the ecosystem as well. Um, I think that also reflects the way in which natural history and natural philosophy are done in this period, that is very much about the kind of comparative anatomy with dead specimens, right, as opposed to seeing creatures in their natural habitats and that really goes back even before so into the 17th and 18th century so the perspective they have is one not of classifying things according to how they live in a particular place but by comparing across okay t-rex and the crater of doom this book is written by an actual scientist um, Walter Alvarez who discovers this idea of the crater fairly recently um, and I just want to sort of take you quickly through the last couple of pages of this, pages of this or the last couple of ideas behind this, and then we'll sort of switch to questions. Um, in the 20th century, again, we get this idea of mass extinction. Um, we sort of shift from the more uniformitarian, gradualist view of somebody like Charles Lyell towards a more kind of catastrophic view, where we begin to see that potentially there could be very, very abrupt changes where something like 60 to 75 to even 80 or 90 percent of the world species could become extinct in sort of one sort of massive sort of burst of activity. Um, the way this is discovered is that Walter Alvarez, who's a geologist, um, discovers that there's a layer of clay at one particular point at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, so in that stratigraphy, that's very heavy in iridium. Um, iridium is a lovely mineral, but it's not one that's very common on the Earth. Um, and so he and his father get together. Um, they discover that there's this iridium. His father's a physicist who has access to um, high energy uh, uh, particle see it as a catastrophic impact, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Again, there's a lot of resistance to this idea, right? Um, paleontologists, biologists, uh, other geologists actually prefer slow and gradual extinctions. And so there's a massive transformation in our understanding of the dinosaurs that happened just in the 80s and 90s, right? So it's 1980 when Walter Alvarez publishes his first paper on this massive extinction, this mass extinction. And it's only by the 1990s 
1997, I think, that he publishes this book, T-Rex and the Crater of Doom, um, 1997. So it becomes or has become orthodoxy, right? And so probably is the story of the dust dinosaurs that most of us here heard, in this room heard when we were little children, but it's only recently that it became the orthodoxy. Um, the other kind of point to sort of think about here, again, sort of thinking about human culpability, um, the 20th century, another aspect of it is that, okay, fine, wait, but it's our fault, but we love our charismatic megafauna, right? We love our rhinos, we love our lions, we love our elephants, and yet we are killing them to death. Um, some of the examples that come out early in the 19th and early 20th century, the example of the passenger pigeon, there used to be massive flocks across the United States, all of a sudden the population collapses in the early 20th century, and the buffalo, which comes very close to collapse in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. Um, there are these various theories that come about in this period. Well, is it prehistoric overkill, right? Hunting that did in um, the ground sloth, the mastodon, almost the bison. Um, can we think about it in those ways? So there's this thesis of prehistoric overkill. Um, and did human hunters actually cause the extinction of those charismatic megafauna? Um, and this raises a really interesting question about culpability and I think a difference between the way um, that scientific perspective, the kind of Anglo-American or European scientific perspective, might be very different from the perspectives that say indigenous peoples in North America would have. Um, that from the perspective of the scientists who argue about this question of prehistoric overkill, they often put uh, ancient indigenous peoples on the same scale as sort of human hunters, right? So you have to imagine ancient indigenous peoples who would have been hunting with stone technology versus the late 19th century when buffalo are being killed using rifles, using guns. Um, and they tend to see that as sort of a spectrum of activity that's basically on the same spectrum. Um, whereas uh, indigenous scholars, those who are looking at the perspective of the indigenous peoples themselves, would see those as very, very different kinds of activity, right? in part because some of the theories or some of the ideas we've been talking about, um, about how uh, the, the sort of ideology, the ideas of modern scientists, that idea of being able to use um, nature as you would, right? So the idea behind the dodo passage, which is part of Western science, which sort of says that, okay, even if the dodo is going extinct, even if animals are going extinct, it's okay because we have the right to use them, right? So that's an interesting question for discussion there. Or was climate change? So this is an open question in the present, right? We've kind of brought ourselves up to the present um, that it's not clear yet at this moment um, how exactly all of the charismatic megafauna like Rusty the giant ground sloth um, came to disappear. It could have been climate change. It could have been that overkill hypothesis. So finally, who invented extinction and why is it so hard to see? What does it tell us about ourselves? Is it a particularly American problem, right? Is extinction something that we see in the context of the development of empires, the use of natural resources in the 19th and 20th century? It certainly becomes visible, right, in this age of empire and colonization. What are some of the concepts that prevent us from seeing extinction or from excusing it, saying that it's a natural phenomenon as opposed to one that humans are involved with? We've talked a little bit about God, right? Sort of religious ideology, religious ideas can prevent people from seeing or understanding extinction. So if you go back to John Ray, who I talked about at the very beginning of the lecture, who says, well, okay, yeah, I know there aren't any more beavers, there aren't any more wolves here in England, but they survive other places, right? He was unwilling to sort of acknowledge or confront extinction. And that had to do with a religious belief, right? A belief that uh, everything in nature is created by God, it has a purpose. In the 19th century, some of these ideas, this resistance to extinction, have to do with ideas of progress, right? So for Charles Darwin, so even as he acknowledges the devastation that's being caused by European colonialism, he also sees it as a form of progress, and so is able, in his own mind, to sort of excuse it in that way. Um, ideas of social order, right, of everything having a purpose. And then also money, finances, right? Again, there's sort of a massive um, profit that can be sort of had through um, the kinds of hunting that would go on in the 19th century, that sort of thing. It's hard to see because of human versus geological timescales, right? So as we've expanded the timescale, first acknowledging that human history is a much briefer part of the geological timescale, um, and then being able to see evolution operating um, or, and, and extinction operating can be very challenging. Each extinction event is unique. So an asteroid kills the dinosaurs, perhaps overhunting was the cause of the loss of the charismatic megafauna in North America and elsewhere. Um, perhaps climate change was involved. Each extinction, the death of each animal is unique. And then finally, 
what I would suggest, and this is maybe where we can stop and talk a little bit and have some questions, I think that one of the things about extinction is that like many scientific concepts, it's not just sort of floating out there in the ether. Um, it carries with it the historical baggage that sort of is embedded in it, right? And I think we saw that by looking at the ways in which these ideas of order, of progress, of you know, humanities or man's right to use animals, to use nature, kind of persists through the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Um, but it's also being constantly reinvented, right? So that even as we still have, to give you another example, these sort of poles of uniformitarian gradualism versus the catastrophic views of extinction, right? Those are some, that's some of the historical baggage that extinction carries with it. It's still constantly changing and being reinvented um, throughout these centuries so that each generation sort of within its own historical context is creating a new vision of what extinction means and what, what's possible with extinction. So I would be delighted to turn it over to you all at this moment and talk about some questions. Yes. Great. It looks like, let me bring the microphone over because yeah. that's helpful for the recording. And it looks like we've got several questions just to get us started. Great. Um, do you mind? I do have like several questions. Yeah, go for it. Um, number one, um, a while back I heard that scientists were taking DNA from bones of um, extinct animals and were thinking about inserting them into their. I don't know, it's not ancestors, it's the other word. Mm -hmm. And seeing if they could come up with a hybrid, do you think that's possible or <laughs> at all ethical since they're extinct and probably can't survive in the climate we have now? Yeah, so that's a great question. I've been doing a little bit of reading about that as well. Um, <clears throat> it's the possible question, it's up to the scientists, right? Um, if it's possible or not. I know that there have been efforts, for example, so to in South Africa, there used to be a relative of the zebra called the quagga that was hunted to extinction by um, colonial uh, forces, British and Dutch colonial forces in the 19th century. Um, but quaggas probably interbred with zebras. So one way of doing this is trying to breed together zebra, quagga-like zebras to get the quagga to come back. So people are trying to do that. Um, another, and this connects with the history of ecology, and ecological understandings as well. So one of the um, natural, one of the scientists who's a real strong advocate for this overkill hypothesis, a guy named Paul Martin who died about five years ago. Before he died, he also advocated the idea that maybe the Western United States should be repopulated with animals that are related to the animals that once roamed, right? Um, so bring elephants, bring camels, bring back those kinds of animals that are close to the prehistoric versions. And the reason he said that was actually for an ecological reason, right? That these were once keystone species of that environment and they maybe we could play an important role in it. You know, Sure, maybe. Um, I would be fascinated to see what comes of that. <laughs> maybe it's not ethical, but it is fascinating. Okay, my second question is, on March 20th, the last white rhino died, the last male, leaving two females left. Do you have any ideas what the people of Sudan are going to do now that their last male is extinct? Yeah, that's a great question. I was just hearing about that on the news as well. Um, this is again one of those challenges, and this is something that, that Darwin recognized as well. Um, breeding animals in captivity is really, really difficult, that a lot of wild animals don't respond to captivity very well. And I think that's one of the challenges that the white rhino breeding program had had, right? That it was really, really hard to get rhinos to get pregnant. I think they still might have some possibilities for continuing to breed them and maintain a captive population, right? Because I think they've preserved um, some of the, the semen from that, that white rhino. That's a great question what they should do though, right? I mean, should you ethically again try and grow the population when you have such a small number to begin with? It probably will never be self-sustaining. And so it's really a question of what humans want to invest their agency and their time in, right? Do we want to invest in trying to preserve this species um, as an example? Because it's a little bit like that idea of the Natural History Museum as a kind of archive, right? Or a kind of library that you can go to to see what there once was in the past. Um, Okay, I do, the last question. Um, recently, I read about the right whale population has gone extremely down mm -hmm. um, from 36 in 1980 to 24 in 1990, and this year only three were born. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think they should do about that? Yeah, um, again, not a scientist. I think, again, that's a great, a great question. What should be done about it? The, what I would point us to, again, is this question of human agency, right? Mm -hmm. And what do we see as our role in nature? 
um, and the persistence of certain attitudes that I traced in the lecture. So Darwin, um, the guy who wrote about the dodo, they sort of see the human advancing tide of progress as something that can't really be controlled for and can't really be stopped. Um, and we see those attitudes persisting in the present, right? That it would require an enormous amount of effort in order to try and find a way to sustain right whale populations. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. All right. Um, how do you feel like the changing relationship between like human beings and nature affected their like attitudes towards extinction? Like in the 17th century, like nature is kind of seen as the enemy that's killing most humans, stuff like that. And it's sort of like, I don't want to say we've conquered nature, but like mm -hmm. sort of like we've, we've tamed it a little bit or something like that. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I go back again to this idea that is very prevalent among European natural philosophers and scientists, and also more broadly in European society from the 17th through the 19th century, is, which is the idea that sort of nature is there for human use. It's there, there to be sort of adapted and made use of in various ways, um, whether that's through the search for natural resources, whether that's building roads through the quote unquote wilderness, which oftentimes the colonial wilderness is a place that actually was owned by other people, right? Um, and so, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think again, I, I wouldn't necessarily see at least in Europe, the attitude is not that nature is a wild and scary place. That's an attitude that maybe you see in colonial America, sort of 16th and 17th century, at least from the white perspective, the perspective of the white settlers. Um, but not so much in Europe. And I think that this idea, too, of having mastered something, though, through the building of empire. So again, if you think about Darwin, if you think about his position, say, in his study, or meeting with other scientists in London, having that ability to bring species and bring information and bring specimens so that you have this global view of nature while still being able to sit in your desk chair, um, you know, I think it could give you an extraordinary sense of mastery and control, right? A sense of, you know, I am at the top of the hierarchy, so of course everything's gonna be okay. Even if the onrushing tide of civilization takes under other people, it's not gonna take under me. Um, so it, creates that sense in him of being, having a great deal of power, right, in some sense. Uh, two quick uh, questions real quick. Um, because we know extension is uh, a natural gradual process and not just a process uh, stimulated by uh, catastrophic influence, would you phrase, um, you know, going against um, or reversing extension a, a process of going against nature? So let me see if I've, I understand the question correctly. Um, is the background behind what you're saying the idea that, like what um, this young woman over here was saying about um, using biology, using science to reverse extinction, would that be going against nature or? Or any uh, preventative methodology. Mm -hmm. I would see. So uh, other, other efforts to say conserve species. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So again, it gets back to this question of what's human and what's nature, right? Which I think is we've kind of seen as a really tangled question. Um, that going back to the 17th century and even earlier than that, humans see themselves as part of nature in really interesting ways. Um, if we go into the 19th century, we talk about Darwin, we talk about the dodo. You know, Darwin sort of says, okay, humans and nature, humans are like nature and nature is like humans, right? He says that the extinction, um, the loss, you know, what we would call basically colonial genocide in the present um, of a non-white, non-European population is basically a problem that's kind of like trying to understand um, the extinction of, of a mammal, right? So again, that kind of comparison that I think for us is very distasteful, but again, that's kind of the way he talks about it. Um, it really troubles that boundary between human and, and nature, right? Um, from my own personal perspective and my sort of what I've studied as a historian in, the, in this area, um, I see conservation efforts and human agency and attempts at conservation as also part of nature, right? Like we have decisions about how we use our resources and you can 
use them to try and conserve an animal, understanding what that's going to cost and how, what the effort's going to be like, or you can use them towards something else, right? And so that's, it's part of the overall ecology of the system, even though it's happening through our agency, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, last one. Um, how do you absolutely confirm that an organism is uh, completely extinct? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes we get surprises. Um, where all of a sudden they had thought that the organism was extinct, that biologists had thought an organism was extinct, and then they find out that it's not. Um, by sort of systematic surveys is one way of doing it. Um, so in the modern era, biologists, for example, who study extinctions in the rainforest, um, and if this is something that you're interested in, there's a great book by Elizabeth Colbert called The Sixth Extinction that talks about um, mass extinctions in the present. Um, basically, you can sort of stake out one of the examples that Elizabeth Colbert talks about in that book is um, the example of a biologist who's created a, a study space in the rainforest at different altitudes so that they can see sort of within one square mile what species are at that altitude, the next altitude, the next altitude up. And they can sort of do these population surveys. Um, and when they don't see any more of that particular species in the population survey, they start to say, okay, well, if it's gone from this square mile, maybe it's gone from other square miles. And so we'll start to compare with others who have been doing similar kinds of surveys. But sometimes we get surprised. Um, so for example, there are certain kinds of frogs that live in Central American rainforests that were being attacked by a fungus. Um, and it was thought that many of them had actually gone extinct about five or six years ago. There was just a news report last week um, that more of them were being found in the wild again. Um, and there are other examples like that, right, where nature is so rich and so diverse that it can throw up surprises at you sometimes. Um, so you were talking about natural theology and how a lot of philosophers um, and just a lot of people in general uh, mm -hmm. of the time thought that um, that like fossils and history was all related to the Bible. Mm -hmm. So do you like have any idea about what um, the atheist philosophers like Hume and Condorcet and I can't remember Diderot, um, what um, those philosophers believed about um, extinction and the science at the time? Oh, that's a good question. I'm trying to think. Yeah, the natural, the philosophers and natural philosophers that I've looked at from the 18th century context are mostly people like Buffon and do, 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 Cuvier. So I haven't read specifically in Hume and Condorcet and Diderot for that idea. What I would suggest um, about Diderot, but also I think Condorcet, is that they had an overall orientation towards seeing progress is a good thing and also order in society. Um, and so they might have been open to ideas of extinction and evolution. There are certainly other figures in that time period. So Charles Darwin's grandfather is a guy named Erasmus Darwin who's active during the 18th century and he writes a book called The Loves of Plants that's basically a kind of uh, poem or, or ode to sort of evolution and what was thought of as transmutation in the period. Um, this is going to connect again with the ways in which scientific ideas are connected to the historical and political context. Um, Erasmus Darwin's Loves of Plants, these ideas of transmutation are very popular before the French Revolution, but a lot of people get scared off from evolutionary ideas by the French Revolution. Um, so that book becomes much less popular and those ideas become much less popular in England, for example, after the revolution, because again, human society, political ideas, and natural ideas are all very sort of connected with each other. And so when there's this massive transformation, massive political revolution, um, which seems to threaten social stability and social order, scientific ideas that seem to threaten social stability and social order also come under suspicion in the period. So we have to go back and sort of trace how their philosophies are received and what they're thinking is kind of on both sides of the French Revolution. So today we're looking at technologies like CRISPR and stuff to bring extinct uh, populations back. Yes. And I was just wondering, um, do you think, how much do you think that the human population has changed in its mindset? Because um, if they thought that nature was fair for their own use mm -hmm. previously, um, and now we're kind of trying to construct our own nature, Mm -hmm. in a way and bring it to an ideal that we have for ourselves um, if it's really changed at all or if it's just the way we talk about it. Yeah. Do you have any specific examples in mind that you're thinking about there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think of the sort of like Jurassic Park question, right? <laughs> Can we bring the dinosaurs back to life? 
It's really interesting to me thinking of the use of something like gene editing, right, or CRISPR technology. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with CRISPR, it's a very recent biological uh, invention um, that basically allows you to very selectively and very sort of in a very targeted way edit a genome so that you can sort of create or insert different functionalities, right, into an organism. So it's still in a fairly experimental stage. Um, I think it's really interesting to me this way in which we think technology is going to solve the problem, right? That I think for some people, and again, we might even trace this attitude back to maybe the 19th century, even earlier than that. Well, okay, fine, we can't really stop extinction. We can't really stop this sort of ongoing tide, right, of, of advancing civilizations, to use the 19th century's words. But maybe we can find this technological fix that will allow us to at least preserve a little bit, right, or create a kind of play park version of nature. Um, and again, I think you see that a little bit in the quote that we talked about from the book on the dodo, right, where you know, even if we can't stop the tide, we can at least create this memorial. We can create this museum that preserves a little bit of that biodiversity. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. Other questions? Got one here. Could you go a little more into um, the prehistoric overkill hypothesis? Oh, yeah. Because, um, like, I don't know, on face, it just seems so, like, I guess, improbable given, like, uh, like the fewer amounts of people uh -huh. and um, kind of, like, in uh, context of, like, nature, I suppose, at the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I kind of glossed over that because I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, that's a great question, uh, and it's a source of a, a huge amount of debate within paleontology and in the history of paleontology. Um, some of the first suggestions that the charismatic megafauna, so like the giant ground sloth, like the American mastodon, um, like the woolly mammoth, could have been destroyed by human hunting, go back to the 19th century. Um, in the modern era, um, there's an ecologist, a paleoecologist, who's particularly associated with that theory by the name of Paul Martin, who I mentioned very briefly. Um, and the theory has some support. So if we look around the world, um, what we see is that sort of when humans first arrive to islands that have been isolated for very long times, um, their presence can rapidly lead to the extinction of large mammals or large, large animals on those islands. Um, so for example, um, within historical memory, if we go back to New Zealand and the arrival of the Maori in New Zealand, there used to be and were when the Maori arrived um, very, very large um, versions of emus and other flightless birds, so like 12 feet high, 15 feet high, that kind of thing. Um, within the sort of centuries immediately after their arrival, so between kind of 1400 and 1700, those largest birds go extinct. Um, they're, they're hunted to extinction. And so the theory is that something similar could have happened in North America. Um, and globally, um, that basically there's this sort of wave of large mammal extinctions that kind of predates to the end of the last ice age, so right around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Um, the, there's a lot of complication, though, for some of the reasons that you suggest, um, a lot of controversy around that theory. Um, one is that how could a tiny population have spread across from the Bering Land Bridge, which is the theory goes, right, so that the seas are lower because the ice is higher, people could have crossed over from Asia into North America. It's a tiny population. How could they have actually contributed um, in that way um, to the, the extinction of the mammals? Um, it's a much larger, larger area of land than, say, New Zealand, right? So again, it's a, a huge space. Um, there is a question about evidence as well. So at how many sites can archaeologists find hunting tools along with fossil remains that show signs of having been butchered using those hunting tools? And it turns out there aren't that many sites um, where they actually find that overlap of tools. And then there are also other theories that are put forward. So um, uh, paleontologists, paleoecologists have also looked towards climate change in that period. So the warming up, right, that's happening at the end of the last ice age also may have been a contributing factor. So there are lots of really good questions about the nature of the evidence, and it's a, an open side of controversy. Yeah. I think that kind of just building on that too, it also goes down to your your views on human morality and human culpability, right? So that if, that if you think that there can be a tendency to want to blame humans for these things, right? Which may not always be justified. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. 
My question is, uh, is largely hypothetical, but going over the timeline from the discovery of fossils to extinction to evolution to mass extinction, what's next? Mm -hmm. What's next after mass extinction? Yeah. <laughs> Really years. Yeah, I don't know. Professor Heineman is the, the historian. Have license to speculate about the future. <laughs> Historians hate trying to predict the future. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a lot of the questions that you all are asking point us toward the future, right? So these questions about the development of scientific technology and bioengineering technologies, right? And um, we had the very question at the very beginning, right, about bringing extinct species back to life, and we had some questions over here about the use of CRISPR, right? So I think as those technologies the sort of genomic technologies continue to develop, it'll open up new horizons for understanding how species are related to each other and why species go extinct, and new possibilities for crafting, manipulating nature, right? Again, there's deep continuities there, right? This idea that nature is something for us to craft and manipulate has these deep roots in the history of science. Um, and I think the other thing to point out too is that genomic technology, I didn't talk about that at all today, um, but being able to, say, sample the DNA that can be located in prehistoric fossils and to uncover the relationships and sort of origins of extinction in that way as well, I think is going to be a huge part of the story when, that's being written in 100 years. Well, I want to thank all of you so much for wonderful, wonderful questions in a very lively session. And let's all thank Professor Yale. Thank you guys, this was fun. <laughs>